Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Lutheran Church here on this Trinity Sunday. It is a day that we celebrate uh, the fact of the one true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's also a day, it is Memorial Day weekend, it is a day that we honor those who were killed in service to this country as members of our military. Uh, we honor them and I would ask that tomorrow uh, you take a special moment uh, of either a prayer of thanks, uh, but observe um, and give thanks to God for um, just the things we have in this country because of them. Um, I also have a couple big, big day today. We have a lot going on. Um, the first thing that I wanted to bring up was uh, at the 8 o'clock service, um, David Chenever was install commissioned and installed as a uh, southeastern district of the Luth uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod lay deacon. Um, David was, uh, has been undergoing an intense two-year um, study program with the Southeastern District, in fact, with the whole Synod, um, to be trained in uh, becoming a lay deacon. And uh, you might wonder, well, what is a lay deacon, and how does that maybe differ from a deacon deacon that we have here at First Lutheran? Um, a lay deacon is one who works, uh, who is commissioned and is by the president of our uh, Southeastern District. Um, he was certified by the Southeastern District Board of Directors and certified by President Harmon for this position. And his job as a lay deacon, his call as a lay deacon, if you want to put it like that, is to uh, evangelize, to do active outreach in the community. And so you'll, David will be engaging in the community, um, gathering people together for small groups and Bible studies, maybe even some small worship services, but also he'll be assisting me in worship. You'll probably see him uh, more often in not just leading us in prayer, but actually leading us in worship, um, helping me out in that regard. So um, we were privileged to commission him and install him at 8 o'clock, and uh, we offer him congratulations at the end of this two years. The other uh, big event we are going to be celebrating right now or in a few moments is the baptiz baptism of Anastasia Squires. And so we will welcome yet another child into the kingdom of heaven. Amen? All right. Um, so big day and we got a few things coming up that are also pretty big. Uh, we have coming up on June 9th our uh, combination of a potluck lunch and our voters assembly. Um, it's, uh, we're going to combine the two. We're going to hold everything downstairs after the late service on June 9th. Um, you can see on the, the board uh, a couple things. We, we need uh, what the agenda is going to be. We'll um, elect new members to our board of directors and our mission board, and we are still seeking nominees for the positions of chairman of the board of directors, secretary of the board of directors, our mission, bo <laughs> mission board administrator, uh, mission board fellowship chair, and mission board worship chair. We have nominees uh, for many of those positions, but the nominations are still open. So if you are interested or have a suggestion about somebody who might be able to fill in one of those positions, please see me. Um, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to speak with them and see if they'll stand for nomination. We'll also be approving our new critical target areas that will guide the life of the church over the next year. And finally, um, we will be uh, voting on and hopefully approving a new budget for the new fiscal year, which starts 1 July. Um, I am going to just let you know that right now the church is um, a little bit, uh, not a little bit, is very tight in its budget. Um, there are going to be some significant cuts to our budget, um, but we are open to suggestions from the congregation as to how to manage um, a balanced budget, which we do every year. So we'll be discussing a budget that the BOD has kind of looked at and the BOD is proposing um, to the congregation, but the congregation will have input into how that budget actually ends up looking um, at the end of the day. Um, you can also, it is a potluck, and so we will be having uh, people bring your favorite foods, things that you want to try on others um, before you tr eat them yourself. Uh, that's another technique. Uh, but you can sign up at our Sign Up Genius or the QR code there for that. And finally, I uh, also want to let you know that we are serving the 
Project Echo uh, homeless shelter meal on the second Saturday of each month. Um, the second Saturday in June, we have the Mazel family is uh, taking care of that one. But if you would like to help them out in June or um, volunteer for one of the other ones, please uh, go to Sign Up Genius or see the sign up sheet on the wall um, as you go into the multi-purpose room. We begin our worship this morning. It is a beautiful day outside. It's an even more beautiful day inside as we welcome Anastasia into the family of God. Let us rise and face the cross. We worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Almighty God has called us to confess God as our Father, the one who has no equal. They are three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one God. You are holy and we are not. You are righteous and we are not. Yet in your foreknowledge, you knew this would be our state, and you made a distinct and definite way to bring us to redeem us from our sins, sins of thought which creep into our minds daily, our words which deserve death because of the evil that comes from our tongues, and our deeds which we know go against your holiness. Forgive us, Lord, for all these and all our sins, not because we are deserving, but for your definite plan of mercy and grace shown to us at the cross. I ask this, I ask you before God who searches all hearts and one another, is this your con sincere confession? If so, then answer yes. yes. Yes, this is my sincere confession before God and before my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hear the good news on this day. God has forgiven you all of your sins because of the blood Jesus shed on the cross. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God for his mercy and grace. The Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, and I invite uh, the Squires family to come forward with Anastasia's sponsors. Your friends in Christ, God has blessed you with the gift of a child, one of his miracles of creation. And by bringing this child to baptism, you are not only showing your love for Anastasia, but you're showing your love for God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit because of his promises, his will to save your life and Anastasia's life. Let us begin now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in the last chapter of Mark, our Lord Jesus Christ promises that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Paul, has, or Peter, has written, Baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So I ask now, how are you to be named? Anastasia Louise Squires. Anastasia, receive the sign of the Holy Cross on your forehead oh. and on your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. We pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you have condemned an unbelieving world through the flood. <laughs> Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved a believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned a hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea. Yet by your people, Israel, and led your people, Israel, through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. And through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, you have sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would now behold Anastasia according to your boundless mercy and bless her with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in her which has been inherited from Adam and which she herself may have committed since would be drowned and die. Grant that she would be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, she would be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jason and Patricia, as a witness of your Christian faith and in love for this family, you are serving as sponsors for Anastasia today. You will see this child baptized as Jesus commanded. And so I ask now, will you pray for her? Will you remind her of her baptism? And will you help her to grow up in the Christian faith according to the teachings of the church? If so, answer yes with the help of God. Yes, God. It is then your intention to serve Anastasia as her sponsors in the Christian faith? Yes. May God enable you both to will and to do this faithful and loving work by his grace, a work which we are unable to do. Amen. Here now, as we rise, hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought the young children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And then he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Because Anastasia cannot answer in words that we can understand, we shall all together, parents, parents and sponsors, faithfully speak on her behalf as a testimony to the forgiveness of sin, the birth of life of faith, which God our Father bestows on his children in baptism. So I ask, Anastasia, do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Congregation, I invite you to join us in professing our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth? Yes, yes I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Do you believe that he <coughs> died and was crucified, died, and was buried? Do you believe that he descended into hell and then on the third day rose again from the dead? And that he now ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Yes, I believe. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? I believe. And she does. <laughs> Anastasia, do you desire to be baptized? Head over the, the bowl. Great. <laughs> All right. Anastasia Louise Squires, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> All right, Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you this new birth of water and the Spirit, has forgiven you all of your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. In holy baptism, Anastasia, God the Father has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He has made you an heir with us to all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We receive you as our sister in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us all out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you have graciously preserve and enlarge your family, that you have granted Anastasia the new birth in holy baptism and made her a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as she has now become your child, you would work through her parents, through her sponsors, and through the body of Christ to keep her in the baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, she may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through baptism, God has added Anastasia to his own people to declare the wonderful deeds of our Savior. I ask now, will you receive her as a fellow member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, to work with us in his kingdom? We will. Anastasia, may God bless you with power from on high, and may he watch your going out and your coming in, both now and forever, depart in his peace and joy. Amen. Let's see, Jason?
please be seated now for our children's message this morning, and I invite children to come forward to hear that message from Sean. So I heard this time of year is uh, in schools, a lot of people are having field days. Has anybody's school had a field day yet? Yeah, did you, did you participate? You know that school? Yeah, cool. And I know that person, she goes to our church. Her mom said we could look at her pictures at field day. So at field day, you run races and do all kinds of things, right? You haven't done that. Well, maybe when, because you're going to go to big school next year, right? You just graduated from Little Lambs. Little Lambs did not have field day. Yeah, that'll be fun, won't it, when you go to big school? Well, when I was growing up, we had field day, and they used to give out ribbons. I hear they don't give out ribbons anymore because it got too competitive, which is probably a good idea because we were pretty competitive. But it was, it was a lot of fun. I remember field day being a lot of fun, and I know my kids enjoyed field day when they were your age, and they, uh, I don't remember, but they had fun participating, whether they won or not. That was the fun part. And so my kids are grown now, they're adults, but I think one of the things that they got out of field day and playing sports was they still like to train to compete in big races. And two of my kids compete in a race called a triathlon. Do any of you guys know what a triathlon is? What kind of a race? Do you know? What is it? Do you want Blake to help you out? He might know, I think. Blake, what do you Oh, good guess, though. Good guess. You said run three miles. Yeah, no, that's pretty close because um, it's got three in it, and that's where I'm going with this. So a triathlon has three events in it, but it's one competition. Kind of like an Ironman, yeah. So you swim, and you bike, and you run. And they're different, different distances. You can do different lengths of a triathlon. So when you do a triathlon, it's three events, but just one race, right? And for a triathlete, when you do that, you really need some support. So lots of times your friends will come along beside you and help you set up your changing station. So when you come out of the water, your bike is there ready to go and you can get your equipment on and get going. Uh, friends may bring your hydration and your nutrition, your water and your snacks, right? And maybe they'll stand on the, along the road and they'll cheer you on. Right? It takes a lot of support to complete a triathlon. Well, why do you think, um, so tri I think I jumped ahead, the triathlon is called a triathlon, you said three, because it has three events but only one, or three events in one race, in one competition, right? Well, we're gonna hear the word, another tri word that has to do with three, but it's related to our faith. You'll hear that a little bit today in our worship service because today is a special Sunday called Trinity Sunday. And at the beginning of the word Trinity, it's T-R-I, just like the T-R-I at the beginning of triathlon. Do you know any other words that start with tri? Tri Triangle, because there are three angles, three sides. What about something you ride on? That's a tricycle because there are three wheels. Exactly right. Well, Trinity, I wonder why it's called a tri word and it has to do with our faith. Because our one true God is three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but only one God. It's a little confusing, but that's who our one God, our one true God is. He is a triune God. He is called the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Christians here on earth, it's kind of like we're running a race. We're running the race of faith, and God wants us to stay in it to the end and finish that race of faith, but we need support, just like those triathletes. And our one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, helps support us in the race. Our, fa our God gives us everything we need for that race of faith here on earth. God the Father made us, he created us, and he still gives us everything we need. 
to live a life of faith, to have health and, and uh, goodness and all those things that we, that we need to stay in the race. God the Son, what's another name for God the Son? Who is he? The Son of God is also named Lord. Lord. What did yeah. Jesus? Jesus is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. And God the Son helps us to be able to try, try again when we mess up. Because what did he do for us? He died on the cross to pay for our sins and then rose from the grave so we could conquer death too one day and that means because we can have forgiveness when we mess up we get second chances and third chances and fourth chances we can try try again that's how god the son supports us and god the holy spirit has been poured out for us to encourage us in that race of faith and keep us going so our one true god helps us complete the race of faith, to complete that race that we have here on earth so that one day we can celebrate with Jesus at the finish line. And that means we get to go to heaven with him. Let's pray and then you can go back to your seats. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for giving me, for giving me all, I all I need to stay faithful to you. To stay faithful to you. Amen. Thanks for listening, guys. You can go back to your seats. The Old Testament reading for the Festival of the Holy Trinity is from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Acts chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. <laughs> Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, 
He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Unlike I make your enemies, unlike I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise now from God. The Holy Gospel this morning comes from the Gospel of St. John, the third chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you have, do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I start off with this image here to help you get a little perspective on what we're going to be talking about today. Have you ever been in a room filled with people and your hands and your arms are loaded with things that you are trying to carry out of that room? And when you get to the door, the door is closed. And the people are paying no attention. It's almost like you don't even exist. Well, fortunately, this doesn't happen very often. And when it does, a simple question usually comes to mind. Hey, how about a little help here? And usually, someone will jump up to help you. They'll maybe pull the door open for you. Some people might even take some of the load off of you. Others might call others to come and help you. But it all starts, this help does, with that question. Hey, how about a little help here? Well, one might think that the benefit of being God, or one of the benefits, is that you're all-powerful and you're almighty. And being all-powerful and almighty, you don't need any help. What's more, if you do need help because of this doctrine of the Trinity, this mystery of the Trinity, three persons and one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because of this, if God does need some help, he can just call to himself. Hey, Jesus, my son, how about a little help here? And I suppose God could act like that if he wanted to. But here's the thing. Our God is also a God of relationships, a God of partnerships. And we see that in how he went about his creation. Certainly, he could have handled all the things he created and taken care of them all by himself. But what did God do? He actually created someone to help him. He created a partner, Adam. And that wasn't enough. He actually created a partner for his partner, Eve. You see, God is a team player. He is not a solo artist. He saw his people, and so when he saw his people struggling, descending into wickedness and into evil again, he called out for another partner. Around the time of Isaiah in our Old Testament lesson, God's people had chosen to turn away from him. They had chosen to reject him and despite the many blessings that he had given them. After all, things were going pretty good for them. They thought things were all right. The borders were expanding again. The markets and the crops, they were at all-time highs. National pride and prosperity, they too were at historic levels. Their enemies were even held in check. They were proud of themselves, proud of their achievements. And that's where the problem crept in, because they had forgotten all about their partner in all of this. They had forgotten about the one who actually made it all possible for them. They'd forgotten God. It was God, after all, who chose them to be his people. It was God who led them into the promised land, a land filled with milk and honey and everything they could possibly need to live. And it was God who protected them from and defeated all their enemies. The people had forgotten about God and his daily gifts to them. But God had not forgotten about them. Nor had he forgotten his promise to Noah long ago that he would never again destroy his people. 
the all-powerful, and the almighty God, yes, is also the all-patient and all-merciful God. He is a God who relishes bringing his people into his mission and ministry with him. He is a God who cries out, hey, how about a little help here? And when God calls to people, he doesn't select anybody in particular. He calls out to your normal, average, everyday people. People like Isaiah, son of Amoz, when he says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Now, before we think that Isaiah is some kind of superhero, some kind of all-powerful, special abilities or something like that, think again, because we hear Isaiah in our Old Testament lesson today. Isaiah says this about himself, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah like Moses before him, was unworthy to serve God. Isaiah, like Abraham before Moses, was also unworthy to serve God. Like every human being that God has ever called into his service, they are and always will be on their own, unable, unworthy to serve God. We are all like that person that, Saint, that um, Martin Luther calls. We are all miserable sinners, beggars before God. The reality is that on our own, we are all unworthy to serve God. After all, through another of his unworthy servants, the Apostle Paul, the worst of the worst by his own admission, God so chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, so that no human being, excuse me, no human being might boast in the presence of God. God our Heavenly Father knows well our weaknesses, every single one of them. None is a mystery to him. Yet, despite knowing everything about us, he still calls each one of us into partnership with him. And because he is the all-powerful, the almighty, but also the all-patient and the all-merciful, God actually makes his people worthy, worthy to serve him. It is God who touches people's mouths, their hearts, and their minds with the coals of purification. It is God that takes away our guilt. It is God who atones for our sin. God does what we are unable to do. He makes us worthy to serve him. And then when God says to us, hey, how about a little help here? All we need to do is respond as Isaiah did, saying, here I am, send me. A good example of this response is seen in many whom we honor on this Memorial Day weekend. Men and women who were killed while in military service to this nation. And those who were killed include over 400 military chaplains who were unarmed, non-combatants. They were killed serving God while they served those in battle. They were men like Chaplain Lieutenant George Fox. George, after serving as a medic in World War I, returned home and became a very successful accountant. And then, after a couple of years, he heard the words Isaiah heard. 
Who <coughs> shall I send? Who shall go for us? And in 1934, George became an ordained minister in, church, in Christ Church. And eight years later, as World War II began, at the age of 41, when he would have been unlikely to have to serve, George responded to his nation's call once again and became an army chaplain. Well, in February of 1943, just a few months after his uh, taking this new office, he joined with over 900 others as they boarded a ship to make their way across the Atlantic to the European theater of war. As they made their way across the Atlantic, in the middle of a frigid night, a periscope broke the surface and spotted their ship. Three fans of torpedoes were fired at the ship, and one of them hit right dead center, mid-hull, causing catastrophic damage. For those who weren't killed instantly in the blast or severely injured, many tried to evacuate into the dark and frozen seas. But Chaplain Fox remained on board with three other chaplains to bring hope and light to those who could see only despair and darkness. Chaplain Fox prayed with the dying. He encouraged those who were alive to keep fighting. And finally, when he and the other chaplains were able to get everyone from below decks to the top of the ship, Chaplain Fox and the others began to distribute life jackets. Unfortunately, there weren't enough jackets to go around. And when all the life jackets were passed out, Chaplain Fox took his life jacket off along with the other chaplains and gave them to those who had none. A survivor said, it was the finest thing I have seen or hope to see this side of heaven. And as the ship sank into the dark depths of the North Atlantic, Chaplain Fox and his fellow chaplains prayed for the survival of those who had managed to escape. Chaplain Fox was among the 672 who perished that night. Chaplain Fox was, like Isaiah, a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. However, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he answered God's call. Hey, how about a little help here? And as he did, he sacrificed his life in a picture of what Jesus, who descended from heaven to earth, did to answer his own Father's call to save us. Though God all-powerful and almighty, by rights could have simply annihilated Isaiah on the spot. He could have destroyed Chaplain Fox. In fact, he could blot out the life of any one of us at any moment if he chose. God doesn't. Instead, out of pure love, God chose to save us. Jesus says God did not save, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus sacrificed his life for ours, that we of unclean lips might be cleansed of all of our sin. And rising to new life, he gives all who believe in him eternal life in his kingdom, standing in his glorious presence forever. Of course, 
God doesn't need our help to save us. He has already done everything that's needed. And by the power of the Holy Spirit received in our baptisms, baptisms which Anastasia just received, God gives us faith in Jesus. And because we have faith in Jesus, because we believe in Him, we will not perish. We will have eternal life. Yet, God still calls out to us, hey, how about a little help here? Like Isaiah, you and I have received God's gifts of grace and mercy. God has purified us. God has made us worthy to be in his presence. So let us respond like Isaiah. Let us say, here I am. Send me. That's what Deacon David did a little earlier today. As God has sent him now in a special way to be his partner in mission and ministry. That's what Duncan and Mary have done as they brought their daughter, Anastasia, to the waters of baptism. Isaiah, Chaplain Fox, David, Duncan, Mary, Anastasia, all of us. We all recognize that we are, in fact, people of unclean lips in the midst of a people who also have unclean lips. But you and I have also recognized God's promise. We have received God's mercy. We have received his power to purify our lips and the lips of all mankind. And he purifies our lips, not so that we can taste the good life a little better. He doesn't purify our lips so that we can speak more eloquently with polished prose. He purifies our lips so that we can humbly sacrifice our lives, our time, our talent, and our treasure in service to God and others, that they too might hear God's call, that they too might be purified by him, that they too might say, here I am, Lord, send me. As we wait for Jesus' return in glory, when he brings all of us into God's holy temple. We wait for that glorious day when we will worship him face to face with all the saints in the chorus of angels, singing with them, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Until that day, may the peace of Christ be with us all. Amen. As God's children, he hears our prayers, he hears our cries, he hears our thanks, he hears our praise, and we come now to him in prayer. And as we do so, are there any uh, special prayer needs that uh, anyone has in addition to what uh, Deacon Neal already has this morning? Any special prayer needs? All right, well, we, of course, pray for Anastasia and her family, that she would continue to be raised in the faith. Uh, we also pray for our confirmants from last weekend, uh, that they would continue to be strengthened uh, in the faith also. Let us rise now as we come to our Father in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, creator of heaven and earth, your voice is like thunder, and the glory of your presence is unbearable without sanctification. Whom shall you send, and who will go for you? Here we are, Lord, send us. Grant us the words to explain the history of faith through your people, and the magnificent glory of your salvation to all who have ears to hear the truth. We lift up all persecuted in your name, especially those censored from preaching the gospel. Bless Pastor Jim and all ministers after your own heart, that they would never compromise your word in favor of the world's lives. Lord, your voice is powerful and full of majesty. 
Make it known to the leaders of this nation, especially President Joseph, that their great privilege and heavy burden is to the populace of this country. We pray they uphold justice and maintain freedom so we can continue to be a blessing to the world. We lift up the people of Haiti, Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza, that they escape the horrors of war and that peace would be found. Great physician, as Jesus healed many, we lift up all mourning loved ones. We pray for Danielle, Brenda, Chick, and Simber, asking that you would restore them. Hear our prayers for David, Zach, Joanne, Kenny, and all recovering from surgery, that they would return to health. We lift up Bill, Leah, and those with cancer in treatment and recovery, that they would be comforted and healed. And we pray for all caretakers, especially Beth and Meg, that they would persevere during difficult times looking to you for restoration. Pray also for the Squires family, for Duncan, Mary, and Anastasia. We pray for the confirmands that their faith would be upheld throughout their life. Mighty God, we pray for first responders in the military, that you would watch their coming and going, protecting them from in their work. We ask all these petitions in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, then forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to bring our gifts to the altar as a form of our worship, and as we prepare to receive gifts from God, from his altar. We prepare by passing a sign of Christ's peace to one another. Let us now share the peace of Christ with each other. As we prepare to uh, worship God with our offerings, I would invite you to take a few moments to uh, contemplate all the gifts that God has given you in your life and how you might worship him by giving back a portion of those. Please now take a moment of that silence. Lord God, Father in heaven, you have created each of us in your image, giving us the breath of life. You bless each of us with every hour in what we call our life. In it we accomplish things which we call, with which we call our talents. And with what we call our talents, we earn what we call our treasure. Help us all to remember well the words of St. Paul to Timothy. For we, are brought, we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. Help us to remember that all we have is a gift from you to us. Grant us the will and the way to worship you by giving back to you a portion of what you have already given to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, we examine ourselves in accordance with God's Word. The Lord's Supper is God's gift for Christians, and God desires that His people receive this gift in faith, believing that it is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. He does not want this gift misused through unbelief in His promise, unbelief which results in judgment. This means that as we come together at the Lord's table as one body, we affirm and confess. I recognize and confess I am a sinner. I repent of my sin and ask God's forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ is my only Lord and Savior, who saves me from sin, Satan, and death. Through faith I receive in the Lord's Supper my risen Savior, Jesus Christ, true body and blood under the form of bread and wine, given and shed for the forgiveness of my sin, the strengthening of my faith, and life everlasting. If this is your confession, I invite you to receive these gifts in faith. If this is not your confession, I invite you to come forward as you are able to receive God's blessing. May the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated now as we prepare for distribution. Uh, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with, uh, we do offer uh, grape juice in the center cup. It's the clear liquid uh, in, in addition to the wine, which is the red. We also, for those of you on a gluten-free um, restriction, we have gluten-free wafers. Please ask me for those if you so desire. Welcome.
Please rise now for our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that with your mercy, you have strengthened us through the same and faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns through the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. God has called to each one of us, who will I send? Who will go for us? And we answer, here I am, send me. And as he sends us out in the world, he sends us with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. As we depart, let us joyfully proclaim God's word and enthusiastically share Christ's love. <laughs>